go, yes. Have you ever been annoyed by a persistent sales pitch? You walk away from the assistants in the shops because they don't stop talking about whatever they want to sell to you? Yeah. Well, then you'd better avoid Hebrews, because Hebrews is just one big sales pitch for Jesus. The whole letter. It also begins by pointing out that in the past, God spoke to his prophets. They, of course, spoke correctly about God, but they had very limited knowledge, being only human beings after all. And they also communicated through angels, who again are limited. They came on specific occasions for specific purposes. But now, he says, in these last days, as I said the other Sunday, we are in the last days ever since Jesus came. In these last days, he has spoken decisively and comprehensively through his son, Jesus. It seems that the original readers of this letter were tempted to go back to Judaism. They came from Judaism, had embraced Jesus as their Messiah, but they were tempted to go back to ordinary Judaism. And there would be much less family tension, of course, less pressure from their peers, and much less risk of persecution, of course. So that seems to be the context. And the letter of Hebrews could be summed up in one word, don't. Don't revert back. Why would you go back to an earlier incomplete stage of God's unfolding plan of salvation? Now that the fulfillment has come, the Messiah has come, Jesus the Messiah, what else do you want? And then he goes on to point out that Jesus is better than all alternatives. And he lists in those very first, very dense first few verses here, a whole list of descriptions of Jesus. And let's just look. He's the heir of all things. An heir, that's a title of honour in the ancient culture, because the heir had property rights and authority over everything the father owned. I mean, we see that a bit in the prodigal son. He could just claim his part of the inheritance because he was an heir. The heir, that is a title of honour. And in this case, the father literally owns all things, and therefore Jesus has property rights and authority over all things. Especially as he is also a, the co-creator of the universe. That's quite something as well. Um, in verse 10, the author of this uh, book, we don't know who wrote Hebrews, by the way. The author of this church thinks he was Paul. The Western church tends not to think it was Paul, but probably a disciple of Paul, somebody who had heard Paul speak. Doesn't really matter. And they also quote Psalm 102. Psalm 102 addresses God, Yahweh, as the eternal creator. And then the author of Hebrews takes it and applies it to Jesus, which is quite extraordinary <coughs> for a strictly monotheistic Jewish author. But it features in other New Testament passages as well. We have it in Colossians 1, for example. In him, in Jesus, all things were created. Which is quite a staggering thought. At least if you struggle with the idea that Jesus existed before creation. The thing is, Jesus himself claims that he existed before creation. In John 17, it's now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. None of us would say that, could we? And if that's not enough, John starts off his Gospel by saying that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and then he goes on and it's clear that the Word is Jesus. So Jesus was there from the beginning, and he created with the Father, or the Father created with Jesus, or through Jesus, as he says in some passages. The next phrase, it's also linked to John's Gospel, Jesus, the radiance of God's glory. Because again, in John 1, John says that we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Thus we already saw that Jesus claimed to have shared God's glory before the world began. And this glory of God is a very important concept in the Old Testament. And I could say a lot about it, and I won't. 
have a look and say, but Jesus, well, it implies a piercing light, imposing presence, importance, the Hebrew word, and Kambod is saying to do the weight, as in weight, something heavy. The glory of God kind of weighs down on you, something imposing and powerful. But, interestingly enough, when we go to Exodus 34, Moses asks to see God's glory. And God actually goes along with it. And he says, I will show you my glory. And then he walks past Moses and he proclaims his glory. And the main point when he proclaims his glory isn't brilliance or imposingness, if that's a word. The main point in that passage in Exodus 32 is his love and compassion. Just like John says there, Jesus came full of the glory of the Father, full of grace and truth. And he also goes on to say that Jesus is the exact representation of God's being, as, we hadn't, as if we hadn't already seen that. Um, the being, God's being, his essence, his core, what he is in himself, which we can't quite imagine, obviously. And the word that the NIV translates as uh, representation is sometimes translated image. It's actually like a stamp or a, a seed, a mint, like a coin. You have that picture up there, so that's supposed to be. It's a coin being minted. And of course, the coin is an exact imprint of the mint. Uh, they didn't have photocopiers back in the day, but maybe a photocopy would be similar, not quite as powerful maybe, or a scan, or why not? It's a chip of the old block. Jesus is just like his father. And however you translate it, the point is that when we see Jesus, we see what God is like. And again, Jesus himself has already pointed that out. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And especially his glorious love and compassion, which Jesus did demonstrate amply while he was here on earth and continued to do. But of course, the aspect of power and authority are there. Jesus said at the end of Matthew's Gospel, all authority has been given to me. Hebrews tells us that Jesus is sustaining all things by his powerful word. Again, that is quite a statement, isn't it? This Galilean carpenter is the one who holds the universe together. I mean, taste of that sentence. Mull that over a bit. Jesus of Nazareth is the one who holds the universe together, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Now, humanly speaking, this is a ridiculous statement. And after the Enlightenment, back 250, 300 years ago, Many theologians started removing claims like this from Christian doctrine because they felt A, this kind of can't be true, and B, it's kind of nobody's going to believe it anyway. Um, so they started removing these powerful claims by Jesus from theology. And of course, uh, the sect that we know as Jehovah's Witnesses, mm. they deny this. I mean, they can't actually deny that it's in the Bible, but they find ways around it. But the thing is, if you remove these claims, like a lot of Enlightenment theologians did, if you just make Jesus just a pious Galilean carpenter with a knack for storytelling, then Christianity is pointless. We've got nothing to offer the world, if that's all we have. Why is that? We go to the next phrase. He provided purification for sins. That's the core of the Gospel, as I'm sure you know. And I've said this before, that if Jesus wasn't the ultimate sacrifice, the divine self-sacrifice for our sins, then Christianity is pointless, and we have nothing to offer. Now, of course, in 1 Corinthians, Paul points out that without the resurrection, our faith is equally pointless. You have to take the two together, Jesus' sacrifice and his triumphant resurrection again. Hebrews 1 doesn't actually mention the resurrection, and interestingly enough, it mentions providing purification for sins, and then it goes straight on to what happened after the resurrection. Jesus sat down, a 
at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Obviously, a place of divine majesty and authority. Again, no ordinary human being would dare lay claim to such a privilege. Nobody, no ordinary human could claim that. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. This is actually a quote, if you like, or a reference to Psalm 110, which is also quoted at the end of the chapter. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Somebody referred to by David as my Lord, the Lord said to my Lord, will be invited to sit at God's right hand. And the early church was convinced that that Lord, David's Lord, is the Messiah, is Jesus. And hence, this verse and a verse, a few verses down in Psalm 110, is the most quoted passage in the New Testament. It's a rather obscure psalm if you read it on its own, but it's quoted or alluded to 25 times in the New Testament. There's no other Old Testament passage that comes close to being referred to that often. The early church obviously felt this is extremely important about Jesus. The Lord said to our Lord, sit at my right hand. Twelve of those quotes, by the way, are in Hebrews, nearly half of all of them. But Paul refers to it. He, as God, raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. That's just two from Paul. Uh, Peter, in his uh, very first Christian sermon in Acts 2, quotes it verbatim. And, again, Jesus applies it to himself as well. From now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. And, of course, this was fulfilled when Jesus rose from the dead and then returned to heaven, where he is now sitting on the throne with the Father, awaiting the command to return to earth, which we talked about a few weeks ago. But Jesus, sitting at the right hand of the Father, predicted, according to the early church, by David in Psalm 110. They thought that was important. And these three opening verses, they really paint an amazing, <coughs> grand picture of Jesus our Saviour, don't they? And maybe you find it hard to, to take all this in. How can these things be said of Jesus of Nazareth, born of Mary, crucified under Pontius Pilate? How can we say these things about, about Jesus? Well, it's a good question, and it's one that the Church has uh, wrestled with, if you like, for nearly 2,000 years. And this is how the early Church arrived at the doctrine of the Trinity, that God is three persons but still only one God. Because Jesus is clearly divine. There's no getting away from that. At least verses in Hebrews, in John, the things he says about himself. <coughs> Jesus is clearly divine. He's also clearly separate from the Father, because he prays to the Father. And the Father invites him to sit on the throne. He's separate from the Holy Spirit, because he sends the Holy Spirit. But there's still only one God. Hence, well, three persons in one God, this concept that we cannot quite comprehend. And some people don't like it, because it sounds like theologizing. That's a great word. If anybody ever says anything you don't like about God, you can just accuse them of theologizing. You don't have to know what it means, it just sounds good. <laughs> when people use it, it probably means you're making things more complicated than I like. Well, as C.S. Lewis pointed out, people who invent religions, they can make them as easy as they like. We are dealing with facts, we don't have that, uh, that uh, I don't know what you call it, way out maybe. We have to stick to the facts that we have. And I'm not going to say that you need to understand the Trinity in order to be part of the Kingdom of God. I'm sure most of us misunderstand it, I'm sure most of us have a kind of, some form of mistaken understanding of it, but I am going to say 
you don't want to downgrade Jesus below what the New Testament says about him. And I believe, as have all branches of the Christian church for the last 2,000 years, believe that the Trinity is the best way to explain the paradox of the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And of course, you probably come across various ways of trying to, if not explain it, at least explain it, clarify it, illustrate it. My two favourites are H2O and the Sun. And no illustration is perfect, they're all flawed in one way or another, but H2O was probably my favourite. Water, ice and steam are all H2O, equal but different, but we still normally when you see H2O, what do you think? If you know what it is, you think water. water. You don't think ice or steam. Water is kind of springs to mind first as sort of a base form, if you like, of H2O. But water and the liquid form and ice and steam are all H2O. And in the same way, the Bible usually uses God to refer to God the Father. Because that's kind of what we can comprehend as the base form, if you like. But the ice and the steam, Jesus and the Spirit, are equally uh, the same essence, if you like. The sun is the other illustration that I quite like. That is supposed to be a picture of the sun, the way it actually looks, rather than the kind of the caricature, you know. The sun is a big fire, right? You know that. The sun is a big fire which gives off heat and light in the form of waves that reach us here on Earth. The heat and the light wouldn't exist without the fire, obviously the big fireball there. They don't exist on their own. Heat and light depend on the source of heat and light. But on the other hand, as soon as you light the fire, you have heat and light. They are part of the essence of fire. And in the same way, the early church said the Son and the Spirit proceed eternally from God the Father. As soon as God the Father existed, and he's existed eternally, the Son and the Spirit also existed because they emanate, that's a great theological word for you, they proceed, they flow, they're born out of the Father, if you like. I mean, the Church has struggled to find good words for this, which is fine. But somehow, the Son gives another way of understanding that the Father, if you like, is a sort of source of all divine existence, constantly gives existence to the Son and the Spirit, but they're all part of the same thing. And if you say that, oh, it's a lovely day, I'm going to go and sit in the sun for a while. You're not actually sitting in the big fireball, are you? You're sitting in what the fireball gives off, the heat waves and the light waves. And if all this seems too complicated for you, that's fine, I understand. Just take in this glorious phrases in Hebrews and other parts of the, of the New Testament and rejoice in our glorious Saviour. don't have to understand it, but you do have to understand who he is. And the book of Hebrews, the chapter here, is still not done. We're still not entitled in the first four verses of the first chapter. The chapter continues to insists that Jesus is superior to angels and the name that he inherited is superior to theirs. What name is that? Well, the title Son of God is one thing because he's talked a lot about that here. And he has two Old Testament quotes here where the Messiah is called the Son of God, which is a title or a name that's never applied to an angel of any sort. But there are hints in the New Testament that take us back to the Trinity, that there's more than that. Jesus, the Son of God, shares the name of God. We baptize people in the single divine name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not the names, but the name. Philippians 2.9 tell us that God gave Jesus the name that is above every name. That must surely be the name of God. Because what name could possibly be above the divine name of God? Or you could interpret it as meaning that Jesus has now become the name above every other name, in which case Jesus is the divine name. 
because they can't be a name that is above the name of God. And Jesus claims the name of God, Yahweh, for himself when he states that before Abraham was born, I am in John 8. I am, that is a reference to Yahweh, the name of God in, in Exodus. I am who I am, or however you want to translate it. And it's interesting because when Jesus says that in John 8, we may not kind of pick up on that. Because we're not used to talking about God as Yahweh, and even if we're talking about Yahweh, we don't know that that means I am. I do that before you listen to my sermons, but we may not kind of hear that illusion there, but the original hearers, they did. Because John tells us that the hearers that were there when Jesus said this, they correctly take this as a claim to equality with God, which is blasphemy. So they tried to execute Jesus because of what he said. They understood what he was saying, that he was claiming equality with, with Yahweh. And of course, executing him would have been absolutely the correct reaction within the Jewish context if Jesus wasn't who he said he was, and if he wasn't what this passage in Hebrews claims that he is, the eternal Son of God, co-creator and sustainer of the universe, who came to earth, who gave his life for our sins, and then rose again and returned to the to the glory of God's heavenly throne. If it wasn't for that, well, they should have stopped him. I did think about this uh, Hebrews' insistence that Jesus is superior to the angels. It, most of the chapter is about that. And I thought, actually, that is not irrelevant even today. Because there are quite a few people around that who are quite keen on the guardian angels. I get adverts sometimes invited me to contact my guardian angel. And uh, apparently you can find out what they call. I mean, who is my guardian angel? Ten things you should know about your guardian angel. If you put good guardian angel into Google and you'll get an awful lot of things that have nothing to do with Jesus, nothing to do with the Bible. Because these angels that seem to be floating around, if you like, they're conceived of as benevolent spiritual beings, but totally unconnected to God. And they apparently seem to be more relevant and trustworthy than Jesus. Don't fall for that. There is no such thing. Angels are spiritual beings, yes, but they were created by God, and they either serve Him or they serve Satan. There are no neutral angels. Angels do not exist on their own accord. You cannot communicate with, with angels. The Bible tells us quite clearly we're not supposed to even try. So don't fall for that. And the author of Hebrews tells us the angels are invited to worship Jesus, which again highlights that Jesus is quite a bit more divine, if you like, superior to the angels. But you may have picked up on the, the end of the chapter, verse 14. Angels are not only God's servants, but they're sent to serve us. Are not all angels, ministry spirits, sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Who are they? That's us. Those who will inherit salvation. That's the people of God, the followers of Jesus. So if you ever feel insignificant, remember that if you're a child of God, God sends angels to minister to you. And we may not be aware of it all the time, but I did sometimes on the roads in Albania, when we were kind of driving this away van meeting in Lorry, kind of thing, I think some angel kind of squashed the car, the van together for a while, because there's no way we could have passed that lorry otherwise. Well, there we are. You may have noticed, you may not have, but I'm going to tell you that the author here uses no less than seven quotes from the Old Testament to make his point. I've used a lot of New Testament quotes. Don't forget that when the author of this letter wrote Hebrews, he didn't have the New Testament. The early church only had the Old Testament. And they still found Jesus everywhere. Because they realized that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's plan. His plan of salvation that he'd been executing from the very beginning. The prophets and the sages foretold his coming, sometimes clearly, sometimes quite obscurely. 
I'm sure David had no idea that, that he was talking about the Messiah in Psalm 110. But he might have thought, I'm not quite sure who I'm speaking about here. In the law of Moses was just a temporary provision until the coming of the Messiah, which Hebrews was on to talk about in later chapters. But now that the Messiah has arrived, there's nothing more important than the salvation that he has provided. And especially when you consider who he is, and that he still went to the cross for our sins. Which is why in chapter 2, and I want to include those beginning verses there, the author switches into his main theme, if you like, well, his main secondary theme, or secondary main theme, which is basically stay faithful to Jesus. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? That is what the letter of Hebrews wants to tell us. Look at this Jesus, he's greater than the angels, he's greater than Moses, he's greater than Melchizedek, he's greater than anybody. How should we escape if we ignore the salvation that he has provided for us? If you, if you ignore Jesus, the Son of God, I mean, who are you going to pay attention to? If you can't trust Jesus, who can you trust? If you can't accept his sacrifice for your sins, who else do you think is going to pay for you? There is nothing else. That is the main point, the whole point of the letter to Hebrews. To the Hebrews. And you may think I go on too much about Jesus. You ain't seen nothing yet. Read the letter to the Hebrews. Trust me, or trust the inspired author of the epistle to the Hebrews. Jesus matters. There really is no one else like him.